Hi everyone, this is Wen. Uh, I am just returning from the very magical place that is Scotland. And I must say that Scotland has some of the most fascinating history and places to see that I've ever encountered. And on the whole, this place just blew me away on so many levels. Later in this video, I'll tell you a little bit about my impressions of Scotland overall, but I first wanted to tell you about a place that I found just fascinating, and that is uh, the oldest building in Scotland's capital of Edinburgh. And this is St. Margaret's Chapel, which exists at the Edinburgh Castle. This place survived through the centuries, and it's really quite a miracle. Um, I also want to tell you about the woman for whom the chapel was named. But first, let me briefly say that on this channel, I like to tell you about unique places all over the world. Places that might not feature in your average travel guide. Okay, so without further ado, St. Margaret's Chapel is located at the Edinburgh Castle. The castle is located right in the middle of the city, perched up on a hill. A hill that is actually the top of a now dormant volcano. Fun fact. Uh, you can see the castle from all around town. It's basically ubiquitous. Uh, you can't really turn a corner in Edinburgh without seeing this big old castle on the hill. St. Margaret's Chapel was constructed in the 12th century, long before the current castle was built, and it was named after the English princess who later became the Scottish queen, Margaret. So let me tell you a bit about Margaret, um, and then we'll get into the construction of the chapel. Uh, and how it survived throughout the ages. So Margaret was born in roughly 1045 in the Kingdom of Hungary to an exiled English Prince Edward of the House of Wessex. Sadly, not much is known about her mother, Agatha. The general thinking was that Agatha was some sort of Eastern European royal or nobility. Margaret's father, Edward, had a claim on the English throne. Edward the Confessor, King of England in 1056, had no heirs, and realizing that he needed to put in place a succession plan, he recalled his nephew Edward to England and made him his heir. Sadly, he died under mysterious circumstances just days after returning to England in 1057 with the whole entire family, including Princess Margaret. There's a theory that Edward the Exile's rival, his brother-in-law Harold Godwinson, took him out by some nefarious means. I mean, this Harold did end up becoming King of England instead, so uh, maybe there's something to it. Margaret's brother Edgar was elected King of England after King Harold died in battle to William the Conqueror, but he was ultimately never crowned. When the Duke of Normandy, later called William the Conqueror, uh, invaded England in 1066, Margaret fled to Scotland. The Normans were from what is now Northern France. The invasion was brutal and saw William take over England. Just FYI, the current British royal family actually descends all the way back to William the Conqueror. So quite a legacy. Legend has it that Margaret and the rest of her family fled London by ship, heading actually for Northumbria in Northern England, but they were blown off course and landed in Scotland. At that time, King Malcolm ruled Scotland. Uh, Shakespeare actually allowed him to live in infamy by depicting him as Malcolm in Macbeth. King Malcolm took in Margaret and her family, and ultimately Margaret married the king. They had eight children together, six sons and two daughters. Three of the sons would ultimately sit on the Scottish throne as king, Edgar, Alexander, and David, and their daughter Edith would become Queen of England. Wow. <laughs> um, Margaret was very pious, like super religious. If not for all of her royal blood, she may very well have become a nun. In her role as queen, she worked to reform religion in Scotland, more so to how things were done in Rome. Uh, for example, she shifted the Lord's Day of Rest from Saturday to Sunday and encouraged Scots to observe Lent. She helped orphans and the poor and established a monastery in the Scottish Kingdom of Fife. Uh, she created a free crossing point for pilgrims on their way to the cathedral in St. Andrews, aptly called the Queen's Ferry, uh, which operated until 1964 when a bridge opened. And she encouraged the clergy to stop marrying men to their stepmothers and sisters-in-law, which must have been some kind of like big problem back then. She also spent much of her day in prayer. Apparently King Malcolm, her husband, was not religious. Many say the man couldn't even read, but he left Margaret to her work unimpeded. Not a bad husband. Aside from formalizing Christianity, Margaret also brought a certain worldliness to Scotland. Having grown up on the continent, she introduced quite a bit of luxury and refinement to the country. She apparently was a big fan of jewelry and etiquette. I mean, she looks fancy, right? <laughs> looks good. Uh, in 1093, Malcolm and their eldest son Edward died fighting the English at the Battle of Alnwick. 
Days after learning the news, Margaret died too, reportedly from grief. In about 1130, Margaret's son, King David I, built the chapel in honor of his mother at the castle in Edinburgh. In fact, Margaret's children encouraged a cult around their mother in the hopes that she would one day be sainted. It's really a beautiful thing. They must have loved her so much. The chapel is constructed in the Romanesque style, which combines elements of Byzantine and Roman tradition with thick walls, large proportions, big pillars, and barrel vaults. In the case of the chapel, let's remember that it's a very, very tiny building. It's only 10 feet wide by 16 feet long, but these Romanesque elements are clear. Three of the four walls are original, as is the chevron arch around the altar. There is only one small door in and out. So tiny. In 1250, Pope Innocent IV canonized Margaret and she became Saint Margaret. Her reported miracle was that her Bible once fell into a river and then was retrieved undamaged. In, in my opinion, not the greatest miracle, but who am I to say? <laughs> um, a very odd part of Margaret's story is how her head somehow passed into the possession of Mary, Queen of Scots, centuries later, and then, and then into the hands of some French Jesuits who somehow lost it during the French Revolution. The obsession that people had for years with Saint's body parts is just so weird to me. In the early 1300s, Scottish King Robert the Bruce captured Edinburgh Castle and destroyed all the buildings except for the little chapel. He, he had a bit of a raised earth approach to regaining Scotland's independence. For more on this, check out the movie Outlaw King with Chris Pine playing the Bruce. It is so good. Uh, anyways, the story of Margaret must have touched King Robert's heart. On his deathbed, he spoke of the chapel and dedicated 40 Scots pounds to its restoration. The Scottish royal family worshiped here regularly over the years. In the 16th century, however, the chapel fell into disuse during the Scottish Reformation. Uh, the chapel became a gunpowder storeroom for the military, which was stationed at the castle. In the 1800s, the chapel was restored with the help of Queen Victoria, who loved Scotland feverishly. In the 1920s, the beautiful stained glass windows featuring St. Margaret, St. Columba, St. Andrew, and the famed Scottish freedom fighter William Wallace, uh, as played by Mel Gibson in Braveheart, very historically accurate were added. And in 1942, a certain Lady Russell started the St. Margaret's Guild. Only people with the first or middle name Margaret, or an alteration of such, are allowed in the Guild. Very odd. I wonder how roll call goes. The members of the Guild lay out flowers at the chapel, um, and in 1993, at the 900th anniversary of St. Margaret's death, the Guild refurbished the chapel with a new altar clock and benches. Nice, right? I got to go here about two weeks ago. For all the fuss, I was a bit confused at first about what the big deal is until I learned about just how besieged the city of Edinburgh had been over the centuries. The Scots and the English, in particular, really had at each other, and Edinburgh was raised time and again, with the castle at the center of this action. For this tiny little chapel to survive, all of this mayhem truly is a miracle. And I believe that the chapel speaks to people so strongly because it is a symbol of Scottish identity. St. Margaret passionately loved Scotland and fought for the country's place in the world and supported her husband in his fight against England. I was personally quite surprised by Scotland. I mistakenly thought that it wouldn't be so different to England. It's all British, right? I thought it'd be a little bit more like Italy and Sicily, like a bit different, but still one country. But no, Scotland very much has its own identity, its own language in Gaelic, which is once again growing after the English outlawed it in the 1700s. They have their own music and art and architecture. The Scottish, moreover, do not like the English uh, and seem to have a very firm sense of who they are independent of England. I, at the end, felt like my far away American assumptions had been properly challenged. And I also, might I add, understand the Scottish independence movement just a bit better now. Perhaps these English should let them be at this point. I mean, they've had their fun. Maybe it's time to let Scots be Scots. Okay, that's all for today. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe, please comment, and please like. Thank you so much. See you next time. Goodbye.